Good morning. Oh, let's try that again. Good morning. My name is David Warren, and I've been here at First Waco for about a year and a half now, serving with our music ministry, some with our college students, and some with our youth. We are delighted that you have decided to join us today at First Baptist Waco. Welcome. We hope that you um, find a warm home and a warm place here today. If you're a guest with us, or if this is your first time here at First Baptist, on the inside of your bulletin is a small card. It's a little guest information. And if you'll do that, us a favor and fill that out, and then as the offering plate comes by later on in the service, if you'll put that card inside the offering plate and then stop by our welcome center on the way out after the service, we've got just a small gift for you and to say thanks for joining us today. On the inside of your bulletin, there's also many announcements. Um, I invite you to take a look at those, make sure that you know what's going on, many important things going on in the life and the work of our church. In today's worship service, I invite you to participate fully as we sing, sing with all of your voice, as we pray with all your heart, and as we listen together, listen with all your mind. Indeed, today is the day that the Lord has made. May we rejoice and be glad in it. Would you stand and greet those around you? Friends, may I invite you to find your seats. Our church has a vibrant prayer ministry, a ministry dedicated to praying for the ministries and the ministers in our church. Our friend Susie Janes has been the quarterback of that team, and she's going to come now and share a testimony with us. Some of you will remember that about a year ago in a sermon, Matt referenced a book by Stanley Gretz called Prayer, Cry for the Kingdom. After I read that book and one by Mark Batterson called The Circle Maker, I felt led to try to organize some prayer teams to pray daily for our church staff because they serve us day after day after day. And God said to me, this is how you all can serve them. Initially, 164 of you responded to our plea for volunteers. The age range was from 7 to 96. But now some of our college members have graduated and one of our shut-ins, who was a pivotal part, has died. And so we need to bring those teams back to full strength. What I'm hoping is that some of you are going to feel led to take their place. And so for the next two weeks, I will be out in the foyer to sign up new volunteers. If you volunteer, you'll get just one name and you are asked to consider them as a member of your family. And so you pray for them every day, just like you pray for your parents or your spouse or your children or your siblings. And then every four months, you'll get a new name and then you will focus on a new minister and a new ministry. You'll receive bio information with each new assignment, and that will tell you not only their names, but the names of their extended family, where they receive their education, 
where, how long they've served here at First Baptist, where else they have served in ministry, what their current responsibilities are, and specific prayer requests they have made. This past year, when one of the staff has had a crisis or a problem, they have let me know, and because of these prayer teams, within 30 minutes, 10 to 12 people are interceding on their behalf. This is really a support system that we don't want to lose. One way that a new team this time will be involved is for Kurt and Aaron as they move to Virginia. Their prayer team will pray them through those early days of learning their new congregation, their strengths, their needs. We'll be praying about their move. We'll be praying about finding some really special friends that will be supportive of their ministry there. And then this team will also lead us in seeking God's discernment for who to replace Kurt. For those of you that are already involved in this, starting next Sunday, I'll be out there in the hall and I will have new bios for you, for your new person. We get a new assignment in September in January, in May. And within three or four years, you will have prayed for every single minister, his family, and his work here. Jay Netherton in the office is the one that gave us the title, Mobilized Prayer Fellowship. But it really is mobilized, because when a crisis comes, we can mobilize prayer support, within 30 minutes, thanks to cell phones. What I'm praying is that at least 20 of you will be willing to, if you're not already involved, ask God and see if he wants this for you. And if he does give you a nudge, please say yes. Thank you. Thank you, Susie, for your leadership in this important ministry. And thank you, congregation, how blessed we are as staff to know you're praying for us and how we are helped by those prayers as the Spirit gives us strength and vision for this congregation. We're all invited into that kind of service and to pray for one another. And we sing about it, hymn number 488, Come all Christians be committed, hymn 488. Would you stand as we sing?
I'd like to invite the children to join us for the children's message. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Are you glad the schedules are getting normal again? You're kind of back to normal after the holidays? You know? At least you're honest. Uh, I sort of miss that old Christmas tree too. Hey, I brought today with me a pillow. Now, I've learned something very important today. If you walk into a sanctuary with a pillow, you'll have many requests to borrow it. Uh, <laughs> No, you cannot have my pillow. This is, this is my pillow. Uh, you know what? Every night, one of my favorite things to do is to go to sleep. I love to go to sleep uh, because when you sleep, you, you get to have dreams, and dreams are like taking a trip without leaving the house, and uh, I just love that. It's great, uh, but you know, there's some nights where I'm laying there with my head on. This is Molly's pillow I borrowed this morning, uh, and you can't have it during the service either, uh, but there's some nights my head's on the pillow, and my eyes are just staring at the ceiling. And I, and I just can't get to sleep. Do you ever have a night like that where you just can't, you just can't get to sleep? Uh, a lot of times when I'm like that, it's because I just have a lot of things going on in my mind that's making me nervous, making me worried. Now, some of those things I can do something about, uh, and, I, and I need to think about that. But a lot of that stuff, you know, is just, it's just in my mind. Sometimes I say there's a little, little, little squirrel on a treadmill in the brain just running, woo, and won't stop. Uh, there's a big fancy word for that, and it's called anxiety. Uh, and today we're going to talk about that because we start experiencing it pretty early in life, uh, worrying and, and being afraid uh, about things. And God's Word teaches us uh, what to do uh, when we're experiencing that kind of thing in our hearts and in our minds. So uh, that's for us this morning. So I want you to pay attention later on when it's time because God loves you very much. And He wants you to have peace in your heart. Uh, peace in your heart, peace in your mind. Okay? Let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you for these precious kids. And Lord, I... Uh, I thank you that we have a chance to live our lives with them. Lord, they live in the same world we do, and, and they meet challenges, Lord. And, and we're reminded as we, as we share life with them that anxiety creeps into their little hearts too. Lord, I pray that you'd be the strong God of peace for every one of these kids and for all of us as you remind us of your truths today. We love you, and we thank you for loving us. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a great, great Sunday morning. We'll see you later.
morning. If you refer to your worship guide and join me in the responsive reading from Psalms 37, verses 3 through 7. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Spirit's call to a quiet place. He calls through the message. He calls through the song, hymn 244. 244. Join us. Let's sing the refrain first. come with our prayer. We come with song. Prayer is in the order of service, and we pray it together. Lord, too often we have become as noisy gongs and clanging cymbals. May our words and actions show forth love, and the gifts we offer help the troubled find peace. Amen.
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Let's pray. Our good and our holy God, we thank you again for an opportunity to gather in this sanctuary, in this room, on this corner, in this city. Lord, we thank you for a chance to pray and to sing and to give and to greet, to welcome. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a light for our steps, that you care very deeply about us and the lives that we live. We thank you, Lord, that you share with us your heart. Today, Lord, as we read your word, as we consider it together, we pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Give us tender hearts that would receive your truth like a seed planted in rich soil. God, we pray that you would give us feet that would walk quickly to do your will. Strengthen our hands, Lord, for service, that our work in this community and this world would be as your very own. And God, we pray that a word of hope and life would be found on our tongues. This is our prayer in the strong name of the Trinity. And we pray together as a family of faith saying, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And as you're seated... Would you please find a Bible, a copy of Scripture, and turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Today, our focal text, as we continue the message series, Flourish on the Fruit of the Spirit, our focal text today is Philippians 4, verses 6 to 9. Love that sound. It's a good sound. It's slowing, so I'll begin to read. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Full Confession, the book of Philippians, is one of my favorite books in all of the Bible. It may be my favorite book in all of the Bible. I read it several times a year. You can read it in a hurry. Uh, as I encouraged you to read Galatians last week, I encourage you to come back uh, this week, this afternoon, before that big nap. Uh, it's a great napping day. It's sort of overcast and dreary. You're going to nap. I know it. Read Philippians before you do it. You'll, you'll, not, you'll nap better. Uh, it's this wonderful little short epistle about life with God, about life with one another. Uh, the city of Philippi was a wealthy town. Uh, it, it was a, a, a town located in, in this wonderful place. This gigantic road just cut right through it that ran all the way into Rome. You know, you had this kind of deal going. Uh, and the church at Philippi was a, was a prosperous church and a healthy church. You may remember in the book of Acts, it, it was started on the banks of a river uh, as, as God-seeking women were meeting and calling out to God. Uh, and, and there a place of worship began. And, and the church at Philippi was just this great church. And Paul loved this church. And they'd been so faithful to help him. Paul was in jail under house arrest when he wrote to this church to say thank you. They'd heard about his challenges. And they responded with a, with a, a generous gift to help him. And he wrote to him. He said, because of this, my needs have been met. And, and I'm thankful for this. So he writes him to say thank you. But he also writes because they're experiencing pressure from the outside and trouble from the inside. Uh, they were feeling the pressure of their culture around them, uh, and it was bumping right into their confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, and that was a daily, ongoing kind of challenge for this church. 
And what happened in the church at Philippi is what so often happens in moments of pressure. The people who should walk shoulder to shoulder and, and support each other uh, and to encourage one another and to lift each other up during those moments of pressure, sometimes people who should be acting differently begin to divide and splinter and fuss and to fight. And so the strong leaders of this church, these strong, strong women uh, who were identified as leaders in this church, they were falling out with each other. They were fussing and they were fighting. Uh, and so Paul writes to them in this moment of pressure, and he wants to encourage them. He wants to call them to, to a, a common life in Christ under his lordship, under, under his reign. And because of this pressure, uh, he responds not only to say thanks, but to correct what's going on in their community, in their fellowship. We could have used Philippians last week as we began this series talking about joy because this theme runs throughout Philippians to, to joy and to rejoice and to find strength uh, in, in the joy that we have because of God and His mercy and His grace. Sometimes Philippians is called the epistle of joy, so we could have started there. But we're going to visit in Philippians because Paul, writing to them, calls them back to the God of peace. He directly, directly deals with the anxiety that is in each of their individual hearts and that ripples throughout their congregational system. He puts anxiety on the table as a real issue that battles against the soul of the believer, and he gives them some resources for fighting it. He confesses to his own anxiety at the very beginning of the book in chapter 2. And, and perhaps this makes a distinction because there is a, as an anxiety that is legitimate that deals with, with real cares and concerns, the kind, of, the kind of worrisomeness that drives us to action to do something about things. At the end of chapter 2, he's talking about sending back to them one of his co-laborers who had come from them, uh, who had, had suffered a sickness. And he said in verse 28, he said, Therefore I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again you may be glad and I may have less anxiety he had this worry in his heart because they were missing him and they were worried about him and and he wanted to send him back and one of the reasons is so they could be encouraged by his presence and that so he could be a less anxious presence where he was doing what he was doing but when we come to the end, when we come down to chapter 4, it is, you get the sense that he's not talking about that kind of feeling that comes based on a real concrete circumstance or situation, but just sort of this profound, harassing uh, experience of the heart that's just unrelenting. Uh, I recently read a book by J.D. Vance called Hillbilly Elegy. It's a hard read, a very hard read. It's a, a story about him growing up in poverty in the Rust Belt. And he talked about how as a boy, uh, his parents uh, were dealing with addiction and, and just dealing with all the chaos in his home that he had developed this oversensitive fight-or-flight response. And so his heart was troubled, and it wasn't always trouble based on reality. And he said, unfortunately, the fight-or-flight response is a destructive, constant companion. And I think when we get to the end of Philippians, Paul is addressing this constructive, destructive, constant companion. This one that haggers us and comes with us all the time, where there's not a moment of peace in the human heart or in the, in the collection of people known as a church. And so he gives them resources. And today, for a few moments, I want us to unpack those resources. And as we do it, let me offer a bit of a commercial. And I should have done this last week. The things we're talking about are practices and attitudes and postures of disciples of Jesus Christ that we all can benefit from. Now, there are those among us uh, that need a, a little something else, that need, that need some help beyond uh, these resources that are here. And I would encourage you, if, if last week as we talked about joy, if you've tried all of these things and you're just still stuck and you're stuck in a dark place and you don't feel like you can move uh, and you're losing sense of hope, don't, don't give in to that. Speak to your doctor. Come see your pastor. Begin that triage immediately. Seeing a counselor is not a lack of faith. Never hear that from this place. 
You run without hesitation and run with the celebration of your church family to whatever avenue of grace God would provide, whatever means it would come. And so today as we talk about anxiety, uh, I'm talking to all of us, and let me zero down on the few. Uh, if, if after attempting so many things, you still have a heart that runs wild with anxiety. Chase after every avenue of grace, however God will provide it. And if finances are a problem for you when it comes to seeing a, a well-trained, good counselor, they shouldn't be. And we'll walk with you and we'll help you. Commercial over. <laughs> But from a heart of love, a pastoral heart of love, hear that and hear it deep. Because we're dealing with things that we all experience at different dimensions and in different levels. So Paul's talking to the whole group, and he's talking about what to do with this anxiety, and he calls them to fight it, uh, to, to work against it, and he gives them a strategy. And the strategy, there's basically three things to this strategy, uh, because Paul was a preacher, and he had three points and a poem. The first strategy is, is to pray. He said, but in every situation, pray with thanksgiving. Richard Foster, the great spiritual formation writer, said, to pray is to change. Prayer is the central avenue God uses to transform us. How does that happen? A couple of ways. One, in my mind, as I think about prayer, prayer breaks the hold of time and place. Quite often I've talked about living in the present moment and sanctifying the present moment and the importance of the present moment. Not to be a person who's overtaken by nostalgia or something like that, but to live in the moment. But there are seasons where we get so close to the tapestry, all we see are strings. And we have no perspective about life because the moment uh, is paralyzing us. The moment is, is choking us. Uh, and we need to break that tyranny of the present moment. And one of the ways we can break that tyranny in our lives is to come before God, the creator of the universe, our Savior and coming King, and pray. In prayer, we're reminded of what God has done for us, and we know that we are loved again because we begin to live our, our lives with the vision uh, of the cross. And we know what God has promised. And we're broken out of that, that present moment, and we're reminded that we're not here alone, but that God is real and that God loves us and that God wants to interact with us. Paul from prison would come before God in prayer because he had to get out of that prison. And sometimes the way we get out of those moments is we come before God and we begin to talk. Another reason why prayer is so important when it comes to dealing with the anxiety that besets us from time to time uh, is because prayer invites the Spirit of Christ. We've sung about that reality this morning, about the coming of the Comforter, the coming of the Advocate, and the peace that comes with walking with the near presence of God. In John chapter 14, Jesus, a bunch of red letters in John chapter 14, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he's talking to them about life after he, after he is gone. And, and, and he said sort of uh, around verse 26, he said, and, and this I have spoken while I'm still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. When Jesus talks about the coming of the Spirit in the life of the disciple of, of Jesus, he talks about the Spirit coming, and, and with the Spirit, Christ peace. Remember last week we talked about joy having an object and how it's qualified in Scripture, the joy of the Lord, and Jesus says, my joy. Here Jesus says, my peace. And when we come before God in prayer, we are, we are being hospitable to the Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. We are opening our life to the rhythms of grace that come with the Spirit of God being present in our life. And as the Spirit comes... The Spirit brings peace. So friends, as we, as we deal with anxiety, as we seek the peace of God, we must pray. All right, number two, and this is the dangerous one. We must learn how to think. We must learn how to think. Paul said, think about these things. 
Our mind is so powerful, so powerful. The way we think is so powerful. There's a number of toxic ways to think. Uh, Let's start there because I think we all can be guilty of some of these uh, from time to time. Uh, Recently, I've started watching a football player named Zach Zinner. He's he's a running back for the Detroit Lions. Any of you seen this little skinny kid from this little tiny school who just sort of took off? Uh, but week before he, he started playing football for the Lions, the, the, the offensive coordinator of the Lions, whose name is, get this, Jim Bob Cooter. How about that for a good name for a football coach? <laughs> Jim Bob said, well, we got to balance it out. We got to kind of get him in there because you give the ball to too many running backs at the same time. You, know, so you got to limit the touches. Well, they put Zach Zinner in there, uh, and he just blew it away. And the next week, he just got the ball almost every time they handed it off. And they asked Jim Bob Cooter, they said, Jim Bob, you said you were going to limit the touches of your running backs. What happened? You've given the ball to Zach Zinner every time. He said, well, y'all, I made a mistake. He said, I forgot what my coach Howard Mudd told me. Don't you love it when Jim Bob Cooter's learning things from Mudd? He said, Howard Mudd said, always and never are two words you should always remember never to say. (laughs) Write that down. That's good stuff. Well, some of the toxic ways we think have to do with always and never, where we just blow things up and and they get out of the bounds. Uh, One of my favorite books on leadership is by Harrington Creech and Taylor called A Leader's Journey. And and midway through that book, there's this this, this section about anxiety in a system uh, and and toxic patterns of thinking. I'm just going to give you kind of the top top list of this and see if you're, you're, you're prone to any of these. All or nothing thinking. You see things in black or white categories. For example, if your performance falls short of perfect, you're a failure. I was coaching church league basketball yesterday. Best kid in our team, little girl, went up for a layup, missed it. She goes, I can't make layups. Okay. Overgeneralization. You see a single negative event as a never-ending pattern of defeat. Mental filters, you pick out a a single negative detail and dwell on it exclusively so that your vision of all reality becomes dark and like a drop of ink that discolors a whole beaker of of water. Disqualifying the positive, you reject positive experience by insisting that they don't count for some reason or another. Jumping to conclusions, you make a negative interpretation even though there are no definite facts that convincingly support your conclusion. I love this next one, mind reading. Some people are just flat magic. You make assumptions about someone else's thoughts without bothering to find out where he or she is is thinking. Fortune telling, magnifying or minimizing, emotional reasoning. You assume that your emotions necessarily reflect how things really are. I feel, therefore it must be true. Personalization, all of this has to do with you. I, I'm guilty of that one. Uh, the Baylor Bears, the men, we got to number one, and I, and I thought it was because I hadn't watched any basketball this year. <laughs> then I watched the game the other night, and, and we, got, we got beat bad by West Virginia. I said, there we go. I did it to us. <laughs> you know, we, do these, we do these things from time to time. Uh, we all are never kind of thinking. You see this in biblical figures. Elijah, Elijah was just duking it out for God. And he was worn out. He grew weary in his well-doing. And again and again and again, he would say to God, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one. I am the only one who hasn't bowed before these idols. I am the only one left. Until God said, psst, there's a remnant of 7,000 who have not kissed the idol. You're not alone. You're not alone. Our anxious heart speaks these all-or-nothing things, uh, and we discount all the rest. I used to love it uh, when we'd have a low attendance Sunday. Nobody ever plans for those. They just happened when I was a child, and the pastor would come in and just ream out everybody that was there. (laughs) Well, I guess nobody showed up today. Well, I'm sitting there on the third pew deciding I'm nobody. You hear people, we don't have any, fill in the blank, money, young families, this, that, or the other. Really? Or is that your anxiety speaking? Are you letting it out? You feel like you're the only one that hasn't bowed before the idol. We've got to learn how to think better than that. Godly thinking is a practice. It's a practice. This is why the Psalter begins like this. Psalm chapter 1, the very first one. 
verses 2 and 3. But those whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditate on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yield fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Flourishing. Flourishing comes from a mind that's fixed on the gospel, on Christ, on the truth. When we meditate, when we chew on that, when we think about that, when we breathe that in, when we prayerfully engage the scripture, our mind, our thinking gets a bath. And that thinking becomes fertile and rich and hopeful and alive. So we can pray and we can think. And here's the last one. We can act. Paul said, practice these things, these things you've seen in me, you've heard from me, these things that I've written to you. I was talking to a, uh, to a seminarian the other day. He said, you know what's so fascinating to me is, is that we are living our life on sort of God's plan B. So often you'd have, you'd have listen to this carefully, uh, don't make me a heretic. Uh, he said, so often you'd read these things, I wish I could be there with you face to face, but, but I can't, so I'm writing this to you. I mean, Paul's heart was to get there and talk to people face to face, to be an example, to flesh out that truth. Uh, but because of the travel plans and how, they got, and how they got all bogged up, he'd sit down and write a letter, and that's what we nourish our faith on again and again and again and again. Isn't that beautiful? That's wonderful. That's wonderful how God works. And he says, what you've, what you've heard from me, what you've seen in me, these things that I've talked to you about, uh, about presenting your request to God with thanksgiving, uh, about, about thinking on these things, these things that I've told you to pray about and think, you put that into practice. You do that. I think one of the reasons many of us experience anxiety on a regular basis is because we're paralyzed by inactivity paralyzed it becomes so big for us uh, and we don't think we can do it all and we can't do it perfectly we don't do anything and the doing of nothing wears us out in the worst kind of ways he said do these things Uh, when i was a little we still had those envelopes that had that check mark system on it remember that you brought your gift, you, you, you called a friend, invited him to Sunday school, you brought your Bible. You remember those check mark systems? We still had a few perfect attendance pins from the old timers as they, they'd wear them, you know? How many of you still have your perfect attendance pins? <laughs> Some of you? Old Peter McLeod, there was a guy, he bragged about 27 years of perfect attendance. He says, didn't the Lord need you somewhere else at least one Sunday in 27 years? And so we had these patterns of behavior, we had these things we did, and and a lot of people observed that there were people with long perfect attendance pens that checked off all those boxes that were horrible, wretched people. (laughs) I mean, it's the truth. They were mean as snakes and no joy in their life. And I mean, and so we reason that they can't just be about this. Uh, And so for a long time we worked to say it's not just about this. But I'm afraid the pendulum has swung pretty far from that. Listen, it's not just about doing. But it's never going to be less. God would have us approach life and faith and faithfulness from a place where we grow from the inside out. Where we flourish spiritually. But as we flourish spiritually, there are some things that are present in our life that we can observe as doings. There are things that we put into practice. So when we engage the scriptures and when we pray, we need to discern next steps. What what should I be doing because of this? What should I be engaged in because of this? And sometimes that next step of doing breaks whatever, whatever bond is on us and brings us to a new season of flourishing and joy. And we, we put aside some of that anxiety that just has cobwebs growing around it because we're paralyzed by inactivity. My second year as a pastor, rural church, deep south, no one had availability uh, to a counselor, it really to good health care at all. Uh, and so pastors were kind of like everything, you know. I, 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 you know, I felt like I was going to have to pull teeth eventually. <laughs> but I remember this, this lady that came to me 
and she was just wanted to talk. She was just so sad about so much, and, and, she, and she was just had gotten so isolated and, and so separated from the world. Uh, and and we, I didn't. I just prayed with her and loved her and shared with her passages of scripture and encouraged her to drive up to Jackson and see somebody. Uh, and she, I don't want to go 90 miles. I don't want to leave this county. All that kind of stuff. And so finally one day I said, let's, let's do this. I said, this week, just as an action step, find something to do for somebody else and just surprise them with it. And she said one day, uh, we, we visited about later, she said one day, about three days later, uh, she saw Bud Newsom. Bud was this retired military man who led the singing in our church. He led the singing because he could sing loud and count to four. <laughs> and he was willing to skip number three. You know? <laughs> the secret to keeping him happy is to skip in that third verse. And uh, so he, he could count to four, but he never needed three. So we let him lead the singing. And, uh, and one day, Bud got a little load of gravel out there, and he was going to put it on his driveway. Uh, and she told me that. She said, you know what I did? I saw Bud Newsom out there uh, s smoothing gravel out on his driveway, and I just ran over there with a shovel, and I helped him. I said, what did it do? How did it do? She goes, you know, for a little while, I felt so much better. I said, what did you learn from this? She said, I learned that I can't just sit there and not live. One little step. That next Wednesday night, when Bud Newsom came to lead the song before the prayer meeting, he said, There was this crazy woman who came up <laughs> with a shovel. But, friends, for most of us, articulating, understanding the next step goes a long way to bringing peace of mind and joy of heart. So will you pray? Will you learn how to submit your thinking to God? Will you act on what you know to do? If it's beyond that, will you with somebody you trust and love admit that? Admit it. You don't have to live in shame or fear. You can trust others with this thing you're holding in your heart. Will you do those things? for the glory of the Lord, and for your good. God, we thank you. We thank you that we serve the Prince of Peace, the calmer of storms. Lord, I pray in the everyday stuff of living that we would learn to bring our, our, our regular and daily and besetting anxieties to you uh, and offer those things to you in prayer. And, and Lord, that we would bathe our, our hearts uh, in your truth and your word and that we would seek to act in ways that please you. Lord, I pray for anyone who is here or watching or listening that is just stuck in anxiety. Lord, I pray that you would open a door for them, a pathway of healing, and that they would courageously walk through it. God, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you stand? We're going to sing a hymn of commitment. If you have made commitments in the privacy of your heart and you would make them publicly today, we invite you to come. If you just simply need to say, Matt, I need somebody to pray with me about such and such, we invite you to come as well. As an act of faith, we pray that you would come uh, for God's glory, for your good. David.
seated. Uh, immediately to my left, I have Ginny and then Bill Estes. They moved to Waco back in July from Georgia to be closer to grandkids uh, and have come this morning to transfer their membership to First Baptist Waco. Uh, so if you would, welcome them and join me by saying amen. Amen. Uh, if you would, y'all stay up here, and we invite y'all to come and greet them and welcome them to the church family. Uh, and if you would, Randall, uh, doing the benediction. Let's stand, please. Father God, how blessed we are to hear the words of Paul this day and understand that through every situation that you're very much involved in our lives. Now, as we leave this building, having encountered you and the words of Paul, may we take them as life lessons today. These things we pray in your son's name. Amen. Amen.